Yet not everyone is happy that we of the six towns are united in one city. Mr. Alf Spare, a Phantom Garage proprietor, is one who thinks we are not. No, not in the strict sense of the word. But I think that it is united in the sense that there are several individual towns, mentioning Fenton, of course, which we're proud of, um, whereby each town can keep its own identity and there should be an overriding body to govern the lot. I would like to see a little more cooperation between these towns. We in Fenton are cooperating in the Chamber of Trade along with the other Chambers of Trade and formed a consultative body. That, is, in our view, is the correct way of uniting Stoke on Trent. That, we think, is an example of uniting six towns. These are the ATV studios at Elstree, where they built an outdoor set for their production of Clayhanger, adapted from the novel by Arnold Bennett. Please, everybody, please. We're going to go for another change on this. Don't forget the first kit, instruments down. Okay, how are you fixed? Stand by, please. Okay, how are you fixed, David? We're ready. Roll the tape. Rolling tape, please. Team 43, slate 52, take two. Hey! Bennett wrote many stories about life in the potteries, but he called them the Five Towns, and this label remains. He thought five sounded better. He missed out Fenton, and it never forgave him. With the coming of the Second World War at the end of the 30s, large areas of the public parks were turned over to the war effort, digging for victory. This film was made for the Stoke-on-Trent Lands Cultivation Committee and shows activity in many of the local allotments and the parks. This is Fenton Park, where the ladies are hoeing cauliflowers. Three acres of the 17-acre park were ploughed up to grow vegetables, a large proportion for a small park. Now Wealdon Road allotment, with the Mount Tabor Church seen in the background. The ladies are just as keen as the men to do their bit. Here's a man constructing a well, a wise precaution against a long spell of dry weather. Here we come to the Grove Road allotment with Fenton Station in the background.
things which happened towards the end of the war was that a certain amount of wear was allowed to be made which was described as fancies. During the war, things like tobacco jars, vases, bowls were not allowed, but a small number of companies were given permission to restart for the home market certain fancies. And that, I suppose, led to the frustration which I think, reading the journals of the day, seemed to dominate the period following the war until the utility regulations were changed. And that frustration was the fact that, first of all, there were not sufficient workers, and some of the factories which were closed at the beginning of the war never reopened. It was just one of those awful things which happened. Having got some workers back, there then started to be the problem of not sufficient materials, particularly coal, for firing the bottle ovens. And there were lots of reports of discussions in Parliament on how on earth could the pottery industry be expected to fulfil the demand of the home market when it hadn't got the coal to fire the ware. And regulations were changed to increase the amount of fuel available for this district. Shortage of clay meant again that there was very little that could be produced. And one of the other big things was that all decorated ware had to go for export in order to earn money to finance the war. And to frustrate the problems of producing for the export market, they didn't have enough transfers to make the decorated ware. So in the end, it became a vicious circle. Well, it had been decided by the Board of Trade to make a film for export about the pottery industry. And in order to give it uh, authenticity, it was decided to employ uh, local people, amateurs, of course, with one exception, and that was one actress who came from London. It was based around the family, this particular family, all of whom worked in the pottery uh, industry. I was Auntie Flory. I was only about 30 at the time, but I'd always been playing aunts and grandmothers since I was 18, so it wasn't much of a problem. The interior scenes were actually made in London, but they were based on a little terraced house in Penkle New Road. It was the home of the man who at that time was the secretary of the, well, Potter's Union it was known as then, before it got its fancy title. And this was marvellously reproduced in uh, London, in the studios. And then, of course, the scenes on the fact. Mrs. Arm, sorry, Gladys. Bert, sister. Pleased to meet you, Gladys. Well, how do you like our smoke? Give her a chance, Aunt Flora. She hasn't been here five minutes. You know, that's the first question they always ask in the potteries. How do you like our smoke? I always say it makes you feel at home. It's all right for you, Bert Harkett. You don't have to do the washing and the cleaning up. Have you heard any of our potteries talk yet, Gladys? Go on, Mabel. Koski Kaboga and a woman yet to the boss. Eh? What she means is, can you kick a ball against a wall and head it till you burst it? <laughs> <laughs> Take no notice of them, Gladys. They're kidding you. Here, get that down, you. Yeah. Oh, what a smashing cup. You never see anything like that in London. Ah, wait a minute, this is Sal's down at our place. I reckon we all had a hand in it one way or another. All of you? Well, all the time, he works for another firm. But this Mabel here, she's a fat little handler. Ada's a paintress. Mum's a cup jollier and I'm a slippers man. What about me, Bert Alkit? I'm a putter-up duck. Putter-up? Fat little handler, cup jollier? What funny names. Whatever do they mean? Well, you see, Wait a minute, wait a minute, it's nice all talking at once. Look, it's quite simple. To make a cup, you've got to have a jigger. Oh, no, not all of them. You can make it on a wheel. It's no use, my dear. You can't explain these things. You must see for yourself. Take our place for a start. It's typical and looks just like scores of other factories in the potteries. We don't use local clay anymore. We get fine china clay from Cornwall. I mix it with bone dust and powdered stone, and then it's churned up with water into what we call slip. That's why I'm called a slippers man. From here, the slip is pumped into big presses which squeeze most of the water out.
It's nearly ready to be made into pots now, but it's full of air bubbles, so we put it into a kind of sausage machine, which makes it even all through. Of course, there's a lot more in the job than that. It takes years of working in a slip house to know just when to stop one process and start another. But you get the rough idea. Well now, see we're going to make the clay into cups. That's where the cup jollier comes in. Cup jollier is called that because the cups are made with a machine called a jolly. You can make about 3,000 cups a day with a good pair of workers. The outside shape of the cup is made by a plaster Paris moulds and the jolly makes the inside shape. The moulds, with the cups in them, are dried in electric stoves. As they dry, the cups shrink and come away quite easily. They are still a bit rough, so they give them to a turner. He trims them up on a lathe and gives them a nice shape. By this time they're about finished, except for the handles. That's what Mabel does, she's a cup handler. There's not much to say about my job. I just stick handles on cups. You know, handling clay in this stage is rather like managing a husband. You've got to know when to be firm and when to go easy. Well, what I mean is, the clay that's dried out but hasn't been baked is very brittle. It's got to be fired to make it permanent. First of all, the cups are put in what we call saggers, and it's how you arrange them that makes all the difference when the clay is fired in the oven. And then, of course, the scenes on the factories, the old factory was Green's um, Crown Staff's factory in Fenton, and then the scenes in the modern factory were at Wedgwood's. Well, Auntie Flory obviously uh, worked at uh, Green's, I was supposed to be, Auntie Flory was supposed to be a putter-up. Now, I don't think at that time I'd ever been on a pop bank before, let alone worked on one. So I was rather uh, concerned about this, because most of the jobs in the uh, potteries are skilled ones, and I was afraid of what would be asked of me. So this day, when we were getting ready for the filming of this scene, uh, I was sitting on a bench and uh, a, a, a rather old man came and sat by me. He told me he'd come up from the slip house, or as he called it, the slippers, uh, to see uh, something of what was going on. And I must have looked rather nervous and somewhat worried, and he said to me, What's the matter, Doc? You look worried. And I said, Well, I am really. I'm a... I'm a bit anxious because I've not been on the pop bank uh, before and I'm supposed to be doing something and I, I'm just wondering, nobody's shown me how to do it to tell me anything about it. So he said, well, what have they got for do? So I said, well, I'm supposed to be a putter up. Oh, he says, don't know where it this elf duck. He says, there's no to it. We always put dozy buggers on that. <laughs> we have pots, we have coal. Uh, we've had big heaps that have been put out by the miners. On the other hand, we've had big holes that were caused uh, by people getting clay. And uh, the big problem has been to shift a big heap into a big hole. People may go five, six thousand miles to Egypt to see a pyramid made of sand. It's because, you know, a pyramid goes up. It's a simple triangle going up architecturally. You had a pit tip made by men. It was a simple triangle that went up on the top. It became, for some reason, the simple triangle, an object of uh, dislike, an object, oh, people must get it flat or, or put trees on it. 
I thought a great dark, beautiful and great triangle, sometime with snow on the top, was more beautiful than Kilimanjaro. The walkways are really the aspect of the reclamation program in Stoke and Trent, which gives our program a distinction which no other city really has got, in that these walkways are being laid out along the routes used by the former mineral railway lines. And the mineral lines will give the connection between big reclamation schemes, the new parks, that we think people will really like to use. They'll be able to get from one park to another, and instead of having a Sunday afternoon stroll round and round the same park, they will be able to go for several miles through the city without crossing a single road. Oh, it's ideal. We had train lines when we first came here. You know, it was really chaotic and they used to dump rubbish under the bridges. But it's really nice now. And quickly done, obviously, two years from a, a rubbish dump. Do you call them, or a tip, to landscape gardening? And of course the children pass, you know, for school. Keeps them off the main road because they can come down this way. I embarked on a programme with 25% grant aid to eliminate these uh, monstrous things that we were left with because of the Industrial Revolution. We attempted to eliminate the whole of the dereliction, which amounted to about 2,600 acres, so that it was a massive total. It, it was more dereliction in the city than there was in any other uh, corresponding city or town in Britain. The thing about reclaiming land, we had quite a number of objectives. Mainly, it's uh, industry, housing, open space. To see these massive caterpillar tractors eliminating mounds, leveling out ground, it was frightening, awesome, to see the and hear the noise that was going on. But the end result was perfection. Well, if one thinks, you know, about the end of the 60s themselves, by that time, then, the springboard was really and truly loaded, and we were moving forward at, at, a, at a pace which was really rather surprising in relation to it. We, we had the area at, at Fenton, uh, where the, um, the old pit there, right over the top of Ellen Cross, all of that part was recovered. Norton uh, Ceramics, who were on, on the site there, they were involved in it uh, also, so this was one of the very first times in the country, I believe, that there'd been this uh, kind of partnership between local authority and, uh, and industry in recovering an area. Uh, Westport Lake also came along. That came along because that had been given to the city in exchange for another piece of land called Rogerson's Meadow from the Shelton Iron and Steel. That came on and went forward. Anley Forest Park was going forward, actually almost completed by then, but not, of course, to the extent of the growth of trees and grass and all of that on. So this really was the springboard, and from there, the city went forward and over fest very quickly during the 70s in all of the various schemes that one can now see around. We were not going to um, move forward uh, in... Um, any dramatic way until we had established a position for every child in Stoke-on-Trent to go to a school, a high school, which offered a full range of courses uh, up to the age of 16. And uh, we said quite dogmatically that um, we wanted a sixth form college, custom built, um, to um, make the sort of provision that uh, we, we had in mind. And the raising of the school leaving age not only meant that we had to have more places anyway, uh, but it gave us a financial fillip, uh, which enabled us, with the agreement of the Department of Education, to transfer monies uh, from this particular area to the building of a new sixth form college, uh, the first, I'm happy to say, and currently almost the most successful uh, in, in the country. So I think that that undoubtedly was the highlight 
of the, the uh, 60s as far as education was concerned. And the very old tip was removed at the time of the opening of the uh, Sixth Form College by Harold Wilson. Uh, and, and just before then, in the August before it was actually opened, um, during the Potter's holiday, then they, uh, suddenly there was a transformation on that scene. And I've no doubt you've got some of the photos of, of it, you know, and seeing that wonderful black and white atmosphere of the steam and, and, and all of the fumes rising from it. And uh, what a remarkable thing it was for the people going away from the Fenton area on their holidays and coming back and saying, good God, what's happened to that big mound that was there? One of the fortunate cases where you'd got a marlow hole adjacent to it, you're able to take the, all the mound away and tip it in there. And I know that uh, on the actual opening of the Sixth Form College, when we pointed it across, we got Harold Wilson there, we, we explained to him what had, had happened there, showed him a photo of the mound that was there and how quick it had disappeared. He said, quite remarkable. I'll tell you a sight. There's one very ill. Oh, we took a heap and we put it into a hole. Marvellous job. In about four days, they'd taken the ruddy lot and shoved it in. And uh, it was really marvellous. They got for half a dozen or so machines. But they were going down this rubble place, to the, you know, just sticking it over. It fripped me to death when I saw them operating 45 mile an hour, 50 mile a bloody hour. Rolling and rolling and rolling. That's what you can do when you've got a hole there and a heap there. Well, you've got much bigger things than that to do. But that proved that we could do it and do it very well. We want a better fence and we don't want this mess, of course, but um, they, they need just to wipe off the face of the earth. We don't get what the other towns get. We haven't got a market. No, 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 Walworths, no, nothing of that. We've, you've got to travel if you want to go for you know, anything particular.